I really wanted to start with the three most asked question on Google. Um, so if I were to go and search on Google, the first and foremost uh, question that comes up is, is vitiligo curable? Yeah, so I, I wrote a blog about this because I knew that this question is asked a lot. And I think that it, it's important to understand what, what is being asked by curable. So um, to me, if we had a cure for a disease, that would mean we would have an intervention. We would give you a medicine or we do surgery or we do something, one intervention. And then when that is stopped, it never comes back. To me, that's a cure. Um, we don't have a cure for most things in, in, in medicine. So we, we can't cure hypertension, heart disease. We can't, you know, there's a, most things we can't cure, but we can manage. So we can give you a medicine for heart disease that, that makes you feel better. We can give you medicine for diabetes. We can't cure it, but we can give you medicines for it. And, and, it, and it's managed well. So the, the short answer is no, there's not a cure for vitiligo. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean we don't have great treatments. Um, you know, there are a few cures. If you have appendicitis, we can cure it with surgery. Um, some, some cancers we can cure with surgery. Um, in fact, there, there are uh, some types of vitiligo that can be cured with surgery as well. We can talk about that um, for a small number of patients. But, but anyway, like most things, you know, psoriasis, um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, we, we don't have cures, but we have very good treatments, which is the good news. Um, ultimately, I want to find the cure. That's my goal in my career and in, in life, but uh, that takes a long time. It's hard to cure something. Um, the second question most asked on Google is, uh, should a person with, with like go see a doctor? Yeah, it depends on what your goal is. So I would say if you don't want treatment, um, then it's perfectly fine to not see a doctor. I don't think that you know, everybody who has vitiligo has to see a doctor or else something bad is going to happen. Most patients with vitiligo only, or most people, individuals with vitiligo only have vitiligo. They don't tend to have other uh, issues with their health. They tend to be very healthy. Um, importantly, there is about 20% of, of people with vitiligo can get another autoimmune disease. Um, but then, you know, if, if that happens, then you can see a doctor. Um, but I would say if your goal is to bring the color back, if the goal is to reverse your vitiligo, then absolutely seeing a doctor would be helpful. Um, so growing up in India, the first and foremost thing that I was told when they saw a little patch on me was, did you drink milk over fish? Right. <clears throat> yeah. Can you tell me, did I drink fish? Uh, did I drink milk over fish? Yeah, no. So, I mean, that, that has been around for hundreds of years, though, that the, the, the idea that vitiligo comes from um, eating fish and drinking milk in the same meal. So actually, a lot of cultures <clears throat> will never have milk with fish um, from the concern that this would be causative in vitiligo. Um, even though it's been around for hundreds of years, it, it is there. There is, as far as we know, there is no effect of, of that causing vitiligo. We think that that is a, a um, just just a, a myth um, that that isn't true. So it's perfectly okay to drink milk with fish. Um, there, there's no indication that that causes vitiligo. Too. Um, right now, we don't have any evidence that uh, diets affects vitiligo either way. Um, and I, I can say that a lot of people have a lot of ideas and a lot of theories and they're on, out there on the internet. I can, I can name a thousand things that people have put up. I've seen them all um, and my patients tell me them all, um, but there's nothing consistent for everybody. You'd think if, if, if a dietary change either helped or hurt vitiligo, I would hear about it more than once or, or more than just in one person. Now that doesn't rule out the fact that it is very possible that any one person could make a dietary change and it could help their vitiligo. Right, but but that does unless it happens in in the majority of people, it's not a useful recommendation to make because there's no way you could undergo or attempt every dietary change that's ever been recommended online. Um, it, there are thousands, so it would take you forever. Um, some of the common ones are celiac diets, okay. um, and and one of the reasons why is because if you have vitiligo, you're at a higher risk of getting celiac disease. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because the genetics overlap. So if you have the genes to get vitiligo, you also have the genes to get celiac disease. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is a relationship there. So if you have vitiligo and you get celiac disease, which is possible, then you have to follow a celiac diet, right? But, but the celiac diet doesn't help the vitiligo. It would just help the celiac disease. Um, I, I've had, I had one patient who came to my clinic once who said, uh, every time, I, ever since I started taking extra vitamin C, I noticed my vitiligo has gotten better. And I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. You should keep doing that. 
Um, the very next patient came into my clinic and said, ever since I started avoiding vitamin C, my vitiligo got better. He said, I don't eat fruits anymore. I don't take the vitamin. I, I completely avoid it. And my vitiligo got better. So there's a perfect example why, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't tell either one to stop what they were doing because I think it was okay. As long as the person avoiding it doesn't get scurvy. Um, but, but I, I think that that indicates that either they were both right, but they had opposite effects and I can't make one recommendation to everybody or they both thought it was helping and it didn't do much, but either way, I can't make a recommendation for diet or, or vitamins or, or supplements. Well, uh, is it hereditary? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of important things you said there. Actually the, the stigma in India is very old. So it, it's about 3,400 year, years old. Um, from the Atharva Veda and the Rig Veda, which is the ancient medical texts in India um, during the Iron Age. So this is a very long time ago. And in those texts, it even says if you have vitiligo, you can't get married. So thousands of years ago, this, is, this has been around. And, and so we, we say, oh, that's, you know, that's silly. That, that we, we just need to educate people that vitiligo is not contagious or, you know, and, and everybody will stop stigmatizing it. I don't, unfortunately, I don't think it's that easy because it's been stigmatized so long. Um, one of the reasons potentially is, is that leprosy is endemic in India. And, and sometimes it can be difficult to tell the difference between leprosy and vitiligo. Leprosy is contagious, vitiligo is not. Um, but, but it's probably deeper than that. I think that there, there's a lot to it. So it's, it's a very hard battle that we're fighting. It's a big hill that we're trying to climb. And that's why we need everybody to do it. And that, that's why it's going to take some time, I think. I think we need to be patient with people, too. You know, it's very easy to get angry at the stigma. But, um, but again, it's been around so long, you know, it, it's just not going to be easy yeah, to change. So, um, vitiligo was is right. genetic. Uh, there is a genetic component. It is not 100% genetic. So um, the best example of that is if you have two identical twins and, and one of them has vitiligo, the risk that the other one will get vitiligo is about 23%, which is much higher than the risk of non-twin siblings. But the twins share all of their DNA. So um, clearly the DNA plays a role that increases the risk. Identical twins have a much higher risk of sharing vitiligo than non-identical twins. But if it was all DNA and all genetic, those twins would always have vitiligo together. It would be 100% risk, right? So, so there is an important contribution of genes, um, but it is not the whole story. Um, and, and I kind of talk about, you know, there are a lot of things that genetics contribute to, but they're not the whole story, whether it's height um, or, you know, any number of things. Um, our genes kind of contribute. Our immune system is what causes vitiligo. We can talk about that. Vitiligo is an autoimmune disease where the immune system starts targeting and killing the normal pigment cells. Um, and the immune system is, it can be really strong. It can be weaker. It can be anywhere in the middle, just like height. We can have very, you know, short people, very tall people. And, and then, you know, everybody else is in the middle. The immune system can be affected by genes as well. And so, so if you inherit strong immune system genes from your parents, you're, you're, it's, you tend to fight infection well, fight cancers well, but then you're at risk of getting autoimmunity. And if you inherit weaker immune system genes, then you're not going to get autoimmunity, but you're at risk for getting infections and cancer and things. So, and most of us hope that we fall somewhere in the middle. Um, we don't want too strong. We don't want too weak. We kind of want to be in the middle, but that's the way genetics works. You know, we could be anywhere on that spectrum. Yeah. So just to follow the hereditary and genetics, is that a difference? Yeah, not really. I think hereditary is is more broad term, just saying that, you know, if your parent had it, you're at a higher risk of getting it. Or if somebody in your family had it, you're at a higher risk. That's heredity. But the reason why you're at a higher risk if, if somebody in your family had it is because you're more likely to share genes. Right. Um, so genetic is the cause of heredity. Um, however, so the, the risk of anybody having vitiligo, if we take 100 people off the street, um, on average, one of them will have vitiligo, 1%. If you have a, a, a parent with vitiligo, your risk is 6%. So you're six times more likely to get vitiligo if a parent has it, but, but only 6%. There's a 94% chance that the children won't get vitiligo. Uh, so you, you mean to say that I will, have to, uh, I will have to have 100 children for six of them to have vitiligo. That's right, that's right, yep. Um, or you'd have to have 20 children for one to have vitiligo. Um, 
And uh, if you have an identical twin with vitiligo, then your risk is 23 in 100. So, you know, that, that shows that progression. But it, it's still, you know, I get asked this question a lot by parents. Oh, you know, should I, should I have children? I have vitiligo and I don't want to pass it on. And um, it's very unlikely that they will pass it on. But, but there's an increased yeah. chance. Um, so there, there are very good treatments that both prevent the progression and reverse vitiligo okay. and make it better. So not just prevent, right? Um, if somebody comes to me and their vitiligo is not spreading, because that's common, somebody you know has vitiligo and it's been that way and it's not spreading, it's pretty, we call it stable. It's been there for a long time. We, we usually like to use uh, narrow band UVB light. Um, that is, is, is a great treatment for vitiligo. It reverses the vitiligo. It brings the pigment back. Um, but long-term, it also prevents it from, from progressing. It prevents it from getting worse. So the UVB light is actually a very good treatment for both. Um, and, and incidentally, light has been used since 3,400 years ago in India as well. So in the Atharva Veda, the Rig Veda, there are also recommendations how to treat vitiligo, and sunlight is a big part of that. Um, so we, I like to use narrowband UVB because it's very well controlled and it's a very thin sliver of light that we're giving you. And that's, it makes the vitiligo better. It works great. And we're not giving all the other wavelengths of light that the sunlight gives you, including the ones that cause cancer and aging and tanning and all those other things. Um, so, so that's one, if, if somebody comes to me and they have really rapidly progressing vitiligo, it's spreading really fast, then, um, it takes a while for the light to start working. Um, takes about three months for the light to really get up to a dose where it's working. And in that time, your vitiligo could spread. So then I like to give um, a pill um, that is an, uh, an oral steroid, um, very low dose, but uh, it, it does a very good job at preventing it from spreading anymore, but it actually doesn't reverse it. It doesn't bring the color back. So it's just kind of a temporary thing to make sure it doesn't spread while we're waiting for the light to start working to do both. And if a person wants to turn like completely white, so do you also recommend something for that? Like if they want their skin tone to even out to white completely? Yep, there's a cream called monobenzone or, or um, monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone, a very long term. Um, this, this chemical actually in, in, 19, in the 1930s caused an outbreak of vitiligo in a factory uh, because the factory workers were coming in contact with it in their gloves and they, a bunch of them got vitiligo. And so then it was taken out of the gloves. So nobody got vitiligo anymore. But then there was a doctor in the 70s who said, hey, maybe this could be useful. So they brought the chemical back and put it into a cream and said, you know, if you want to remove the rest of your color and make essentially make vitiligo worse, that could be a treatment. And that is the only FDA approved treatment currently for vitiligo is, is this cream to make vitiligo worse and get rid of the skin color to turn completely white. Uh, so is that a cream like recommended like for a healthy lifestyle or does it affect in the long term? As far as we can tell, it, it, it doesn't have any, any bad long-term effects um, other than you know, removing your skin color makes you sensitive to the sun. And, and there are a number of things, you know, it, it's a big decision to make. Um, but, but so far it doesn't, doesn't appear to have um, side effects that will make you uh, unhealthy or sick. Yeah. Um, so first, most patients, most individuals with vitiligo um, don't have family members with it. So 85% of those who get vitiligo do not have a family member. So you're in, you're in the, in, in the, one of the most common. Um, and then it, it is associated with autoimmunity. It is an autoimmune disease. There can be other autoimmune diseases. Um, sunburns, I have definitely been reported to, to induce it. So a lot of times people notice vitiligo after a sunburn. So, so it, that, that is a kind of a physical stress that can kind of cause inflammation in vitiligo. And then I think you're talking about emotional stress. Um, and I've heard from many, many patients that emotional stress makes their vitiligo worse as well. It's very hard to measure though. As you can imagine, some people, um, one thing in their life could be very stressful, but for another person, it might not be as stressful. So some people, you know, their stress is during um, final exams in college. That's a very stressful thing. And they notice their vitiligo gets worse. And for other people, it might be losing a family member. For other people, it might be going through a divorce. Um, and, and so there's a lot of things that cause stress that are hard to measure. Um, but I do hear from people all the time that they notice their vitiligo spreads when they're stressed. Skin cancer. No, no, we are... um, actually, you're less likely to get skin cancer, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, we would say that that's counterintuitive, but there are now very large studies that show the risk of skin cancer if you have vitiligo is less than if you don't have vitiligo. It's about three times less likely. 
Um, it's not impossible. So it's still possible to get skin cancer with vitiligo, but, but some people, uh, Alan Tayeb in, in France calls vitiligo the white armor um, because it's an armor against skin cancer. Not at all. Yeah, no. So there's no connection between white food and vitiligo. Okay. There is, only there is doctor. So the other thing is monobenzone, this cream that we already talked about. It, if you apply it to your skin, it lightens your skin. So someone who doesn't have vitiligo, if they put monobenzone on their skin, their skin turns lighter. But a proportion of them, about 2 to 4% of people who put monobenzone on their skin get vitiligo from it. And so there is a connection between skin lightening. If you have products that lighten the skin, there's a connection to vitiligo. So that can cause a, a skin lightening chemical can cause vitiligo, but white foods don't. Um, there was actually a, a, a skin lightening okay. that was developed in Japan in 2013. Uh, and over 18,000 people got vitiligo after using the skin lightening product. Um, so there's a very strong connection between skin lightening creams and getting vitiligo. Um, um, so I'm actually, I actually participated into the drug trial for AMG 714. Um, if you can shed some light upon that research, I would, uh, I, I would love to hear from you. Wow. Oh, that's great. That's exciting. Yeah. I, um, we, we, we initially asked the question, why do people get vitiligo? Why does vitiligo return in the exact same spot when treatments are stopped? So if we give you treatment, UVB light, whatever, um, even jack inhibitors, if we give you those medicines, the vitiligo gets better. But when you stop those medicines, um, then vitiligo tends to come back. And when it comes back, it comes back in the same spot. If you've got a spot here, it comes back there. So there must be memory in the skin. The skin must have a way to remember that it's supposed to have vitiligo. And we wanted to know why that was. And so we spent a long time studying it. And, and we and others around the world discovered that that memory is due to immune cells that go into the skin and cause the vitiligo. They kill the pigment cells. And then they become memory cells, which means they, they um, glue themselves into the skin and they stay there forever. So if the pigment cells try to come back, they will kill them and prevent that. And if you use a drug like a JAK inhibitor, they can't do it. So the pigment comes back. But if you stop the drug, they, they wake back up. They've been put to sleep and then they wake back up and start the whole process again. So we discovered also that those cells require uh, a, a protein called IL-15, interleukin-15 for their survival. And if you block inter interleukin-15, the cells are erased and they're removed from the skin. And so that memory is gone. So then vitiligo doesn't come back and it doesn't relapse. So we found that in the mouse. Um, and we actually were able to get a trial uh, funded from the NIH here in the U.S. to, to test this in humans. Um, and AMG 714 was a drug that blocks IL-15. Um, and so I got funding. We started to, to prepare for the clinical trial. And then I started a company to, to make a drug to block IL-15 by targeting the receptor, not the, not the cytokine. Um, not the protein, but its receptor, which we think is a much better approach. And we can, you know, that we could talk about that. It would take a while. Um, but I had to, re I had a conflict of interest now because I had my own company uh, that was competing with this other drug. And so I had to recuse myself and step down from that trial. Um, but the NIH liked the idea so much, they wanted to push the trial forward without me. Um, so they found a different PI, uh, Brett King, actually, who, who was one of the first to test the, the first to test jack inhibitors in vitiligo. Um, he is now the principal, the PI of that trial and making that go forward. And, and my company is, is still progressing and, and we hope to be um, in clinical trials and in humans in about a year and a half. 